Well, how is that reading for a Canada Day reading? Strong language. Mixing everything up. Overthrowing governments. Destroying foreign powers. Dismantling the world of weapons and throwing armies into confusion so that they end up killing one another. Well, happy Canada Day to you too. I ask that you not get worked up about the language and the images as we hear them today from a 21st century mindset. These are ancient images, ancient metaphors actually, that numerous commentators remind us are actually Messiah language, the language that's used to talk about what will happen as God sends forth the much-awaited Messiah. Throughout this book of Haggai, there has been one call, one claim. And as we've been going through this eight-part sermon series, and we're on part seven now, you'll remember what that claim is. Right? <laughs> People of Israel, come and rebuild the temple. Make it clear through your actions or your life that God is important to you. Here is the last prophecy, and we're reminded of a claim that has been made to the people, a claim that God desires to be with the people as well, that God will send a Messiah. As I've said all along, this message is just as clear and meaningful today as it was when Haggai first delivered it. People of faith, it's time to rebuild. It's time to show that God is important to us, to draw close to God once again through new ways. God still wants to be close to us. But as we are post-Messiah people, meaning that we believe that the Messiah has already come through the person of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit with us. We are already in that place of knowing that God is with us with the Holy Spirit. It's time to rebuild the temple. It's clear that we are no longer in the heyday of religious practice and connection anymore. As evidenced by the building that we're in right now, this very building, a building with a sanctuary that seats approximately 800 people and at one time would have been largely filled every single week. Overall, within the larger church, our rituals of worship have become outdated, at the very least meaning, meaningless to some. But to many others have become very painful signs of, and reminders of abuse and of judgment and of isolation. It seems that today people would much rather go to the cottage or go shopping or spend the day by the pool than coming together in community and worshiping God. It's a time to rebuild the temple. As we look back over history, it seems that about every 500 years there's a time of reformation that takes place within the church community. Our last major time was with Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran denomination, not the American civil rights activist. <laughs> At that time, there was a great need to create options, to create divisions within the church as people broke away from the feel and the control of the Catholic Church. Since then, we have spent endless hours in debate over our differences, what sets us apart from other believers, and why we're bound for heaven when others are not. No wonder why the church is in the state that it is in today. Today our congregations, our worshipping church communities, are drastically smaller than they have ever been during our lifetimes. So what do we need to do? We actually need to do the opposite of what was needed when Martin Luther was doing his work. And instead of looking at our differences, we need to recognize our similarities. The things that we hold in common. Furthermore, I believe that in today's call to rebuild the church, that we're being asked to do this 
not only with those from the Christian faith tradition, but from others as well, from all those who experience God in any way, through different forms of religion and belief. I strongly believe that as people of faith in 2018, we are being called to tear down the walls and divisions that block us from getting to know one another, to glimpsing God and seeing and experiencing God as others experience God. And if we are confident in our own faith, in the place where we come from, in the path that we are on, then this can only help us to grow spiritually. But that's kind of the larger picture. There are smaller steps that we need to take as we continue on this journey. Brene Brown, in her latest book, Braving the Wilderness, speaks about the absolute impact and value of connecting to others and how this often helps and happens through shared experience. As the regular, anybody who has come to this church over the last period of time and the regular congregants have experienced versus the irregular congregants, things that you say and you think, <laughs> whichever they may be within MCC. <laughs> But as people have heard, you know that I find great truth in the writings of Brene Brown. I've delivered one sermon series in particular on her writing. And once again, find that there's truth in what she shares, because it's simple, and it's straightforward, and it rings true over and over again. We need to belong. We need to find ways to connect in meaningful ways. She speaks about the power that she feels and the pull that she often has felt to go and to gather, to be with others at church, to sing and to pray, especially at times of disaster and of grief. I've seen it right here. People who have come to be with us and to worship and to pray together on a Sunday when the horrific news had just come out about the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. That Sunday, people wanted to connect with others and to know that they would be in a safe place to feel and to vent their grief. In her book, she gives a number of examples of shared experiences that she's had and that have touched her in meaningful ways. Attending a con concert with her brother and her sisters and singing with absolute abandon and having one of them tape that experience or to record it <coughs> and then to share that with them so that they could see themselves in the moment, feeling closer because of the love of the music and the magic of the moment. Sharing feelings of grief with other moms over the Sandy Hook school shooting. Gathering on the roadside with others at the time of the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Different experiences burn themselves into our mind and into our collective experience, our collective consciousness. And this is often spoken about, we often speak about it after as a, do you remember where you were when kind of experience? For example, where were you when the two planes crashed into the trade towers? In that particular example, I remember my own experience of longing to be with others, to show solidarity with my cousins to the south, to stand in outrage at the useless loss of life and the destruction of two landmark icons in a skyline that was world famous. When these things happen, we need to be together. She writes, being alone in the midst of the wildly, report, widely reported trauma Watching endless hours of 24 hours news or reading countless articles on the internet's the quickest way to anxiety and to fear, to have it tiptoe into your heart and plant the roots of secondary trauma. How we combat this is by showing up, not just physically, but emotionally, choosing to engage and to take part, not just be bystanders in life. But instead of staying on our own and isolating, to reach out and to become part of a group, a committee, a 
the church. To gather where people are gathering to share their grief, to share their experience, to share their love. This is an important lesson for us all, one that goes well beyond the circumstances of traumatic societal changing events, but touches on every aspect of life. We need to practice connection. This goes hand in hand with what we were talking about last week, disconnecting from our technology and in particular our cell phones so that we can connect with one another. But it takes the idea further and it develops it, reminding us that we need to be open to those moments where our lives can touch and be touched by others. We need to choose to show up and to engage fully in the moment, in what's happening, as Brene writes, we need these moments with strangers as reminders that despite how much we might dislike someone on Facebook or even in person, we are still inextricably connected. And the more we show up, the more difficult it becomes to deny our human connection. The reason why this has value is that when we gather, when we connect and share an experience, we feel the sensation of the sacredness that happens when we are part of something that's bigger than ourselves. I'm reminded on this Canada Day that this can even include experiences like going to watch fireworks with others, attending civic functions, engaging in smaller art groups and taking part in art shows with others. Holding hands with strangers is a way of helping us to remember the amazing power of the most rudimentary aspects of what it means to be human, to be people of God. That we must be connected <coughs> and we must work at maintaining that connection with others. If we're going to rebuild the temple, find new meaningful ways to bring God back into our own individual lives as well as the life of the church, we need to continue to find ways to connect. As individuals, this includes making the choice to show up, to actively participate both physically and emotionally in community events and in church events. While I was on vacation, we held our first movie night in quite a while. And I thank everybody who was involved in pulling that together and making it happen. We need to do more. We need to have more opportunity just to share a laugh and to connect and to see Kristen raise her eyes, her eyebrows as Nobody else does quite like her. <laughs> As a community, we need to actively seek out and create ways for us to provide opportunities for others to feel a part of something bigger. Something that's real and something that's positive and at times something that can help people deal with their own individual and collective grief. I've spoken about it before, but for us to do this, we need to have the courage to be vulnerable. It's scary to do things with strangers, let alone hold hands with them. But I can guarantee you that it provides the greatest chance or possibility of new personal growth not to mention new possibilities for us as a congregation as we fix the fabric of society and rebuild the temple together. Amen. Amen.